CMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help. It is 7.33 p.m. on Tuesday, October 22nd, 2024. Good evening. My name is Christian Klein. I am the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals, and I'm calling this meeting of the board to order. I'd first like to confirm that all members and anticipated officials are present. Uh, members of the Zoning Board of Appeals, uh, Patrick Hanlon. Here. Venkat Holly. Here. Daniel Riccadelli. Here. Elaine Hoffman. Here. And Adam LeBlanc. Yeah. And thank you all. I will note Roger DuPont is unable to join us this evening. Um, from the town, we have Colleen Ralston, our zoning assistant. Here. Good to have you with us. And I don't believe we have anyone else representing the town with us this evening. Um, so we have two dockets on our agenda just to confirm attendance. Um, I see that Jackie Lee is here on behalf of docket 3820057 Ariel Street. And um, is uh, for docket 3822 uh, 20 Pond Lane. Um, is there someone here representing Pond Lane Realty? Good evening. Yes, Doug Troyer on behalf of uh, the owner, as well as uh, the owner, Nick Boyd, is present with me tonight. Perfect. Thanks so much. Thank you. So tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely, consistent with the supplemental budget bill signed by Governor Healy on March, 9th, uh, March 29th, 2023, which extended temporary provisions pertaining to the open meeting law to March 31st, 2025. The extension of these provisions allows public bodies to hold its meetings remotely by providing live, adequate, alternative means of public access to the deliberations. This meeting is being recorded and will be broadcast by ACMI. Members of the public who are participating by Zoom and who wish to offer public comment should be aware that they will be asked to provide their full name and address so that a complete public record of the meeting can be taken in accordance with state law. All participants of this meeting are advised that people may be listening to the meeting without offering public comment, and those people are not required to identify themselves. Any votes that are taken this evening will be conducted by roll call. All supporting materials that have been provided to members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. As chair, I reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. As the board will be taking up new business at this meeting, as chair, I make the following land acknowledgement. Whereas the Zoning Board of Appeals for the town of Arlington, Massachusetts, discusses and arbitrates the use of land in Arlington, formerly known as monotomy, an Algonquin word meaning swift waters, the board hereby acknowledges that the town of Arlington is located on the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts tribe, the tribe of indigenous peoples from whom the colony, province, and commonwealth have taken their names. We pay our respects to the ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who still inhabit historic Massachusetts territories today. So uh, just a notice on procedure, um, at the end of the discussion of each individual hearing, the board will vote to either continue the public hearing to a specific date to continue receiving testimony on the matter, or the board will vote to close the public hearing ending receipt of new testimony. The board will then proceed to the next item on the agenda. Over the coming days, the board will prepare a draft decision based on the testimony received and the discussions that took place during the public hearing, and that decision will be voted on at the next available meeting of the board. As there are no administrative items requiring a vote from the board, we will proceed directly to the public hearings. Uh, before opening the meeting for public hearings, here are some ground rules for clear and effective conduct of tonight's business. After I announce each agenda item, I will ask the applicant to introduce themselves for themselves and make their presentation to the board. I will then request that members of the board ask what questions they have on the proposal. After the board's questions have been answered, I will open the meeting for public comment. At the conclusion of public comment, the board will deliberate and vote to either continue or close the public hearing. All votes will be conducted by roll call vote. The final vote on any matter before the board will be taken at a subsequent meeting once the written decision has been drafted and provided to the board. The decision will then be filed with the town clerk starting the 20-day appeal period under state law. After that time, the applicant may proceed with their building permit. However, under state law, no decision granted by this board shall take effect until a certified copy of the final decision has been filed with and recorded at the Middlesex South Registry of Deeds in Cambridge by the applicant. So with that, um, I move to the first item on our agenda, which is uh, docket 3320057 Ariel Street. Um, I understand the owner is here. I know the uh, their contractor has uh, filed a request for a continuance, um, but I believe the homeowner may have had a question for the board before the board 
um, moves on this matter. Yes, hi there. Can you hear me okay? We can, thank you. Yes, hi there. Um, nice to see everyone. Um, I wasn't sure if we were on the, I'm sorry, I'm having a problem with my camera. Oh, here we go, okay. Um, nice to see everyone. I wasn't sure if we were still on the agenda. Our contractor had let us know that we were bumped to the next week, so yep. but we're still so we are. Wasn't sure. Yeah, so all we're doing is we're just voting to continue. So um, the date to so the next meeting of the board, um, I just have that in front of me is Tuesday, November 12th. And so we would just be shifting to that date. There was some additional information that the board was seeking from the uh, from the contractor that did not come in um, in time for this hearing. And so they had asked if they could have some additional time to make sure that all the documentation was in order. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Um, wonderful. So I guess we'll just pump to next week then? So we'll, we, we will go to November 7th, November 12th. So oh, Tuesday, okay. November 12th. Okay, wonderful. Great, thank you so okay, much. Thank you for letting me know. Absolutely. Uh, so with that, um, the chair will accept a motion to continue the public hearing for docket 3820-57 Ariel Street until Tuesday, November 12th, 2024 at 7.30 p.m. Mr. Chairman, so moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Uh, second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Riccadelli. So roll call vote of the board to continue. Um, Mr. Hanlon? Yes. Mr. Holly? Yes. Mr. Riccadelli? Yes. Ms. Hoffman? Yes. Mr. LeBlanc? Yes. And the chair votes yes. So we are continued on 57 Ariel Street. Um, thanks again to Ms. Lee for being with us this evening. Uh, with that, we will move on to the next item on our agenda, which is docket 3822 20 Pond Lane. Um, this is a request for a special permit under section 811A of the zoning bylaw of the town of Arlington. Uh, so with that, if I could ask um, Mr. Troyer to introduce himself and tell us what the applicant is seeking to do. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Chair and the rest of the board members. Uh, again, my name is Doug Troyer. Uh, I represent the applicant Pond Lane Realty LLC. Uh, with me tonight is uh, Nick and Belinda Boyd, uh, who are the owners of the property. Um, as our application has indicated, we are looking for an application for special use permit and or clarification that the existing commercial garage for commercial office use, storage of vehicles and equipment and light construction work at the property located at 20 Pond Lane um, can continue. Uh, the property is located in R2 zoning district. Uh, it's classified as a residential commercial property. It contains about 9,200 square feet with about a approximately 4,400 uh, two family residents and a approximately 3,300 uh, commercial garage located on the property. Uh, this property uh, was uh, purchased by my client in 2015, was, was owned by the Simonian family uh, for some time, dating back to 1961. Uh, Mr. Simonian, back in 1963, after he purchased the property, which at that time, I believe, only had a uh, residence on the property, uh, sought the ability to uh, build a commercial garage and came before this board in, in around 1963, uh, seeking a permit or the ability to, const to construct the commercial garage, which is basically still the same size and shape of what was constructed back in 1963 after the board granted that permit. Um, the garage, in essence, is about 33, oh, exactly is 3,375 square feet. It's about 14 feet in height. It contains a large storage space area, office for business operations, a mezzanine storage area, and two bathrooms for employees. Uh, this structure has basically was constructed subsequent to the um, subsequent to the grant by the ZBA in 1963, and in essence, is still the same uh, size, shape, and configuration as it was back in those days, with some minor um, beautification, which I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, about two years after he obtained the uh, permit to construct the garage, he came back to the Zoning Board of Appeals seeking permission to, I believe his business was uh, not as busy as he thought, so he came back to basically uh, seek permission to rent out uh, certain aspects of the garage uh, on a property for additional business use. And in essence, uh, he sought permission to rent the remaining space in the garage for commercial businesses involving industrial truck batteries for the operation of their business and the storage of their vehicles. That was granted. 
And in essence, from 1963 to 2015, the Simonian family still owned the property. It was basically transferred amongst themselves into various trusts. And they, in essence, commercial uses as uh, were utilized since 1963. And I believe the majority of the time uh, from 63 to 2015, an auto body shop and an auto mechanic business operated out of the garage uh, for a significant part of that time. My client purchased the property in October of 2015. And at that time, the auto body shop stopped operating out of there. Uh, but the Arlington Motor Mart remained as a tenant of the applicant and continued to perform auto repair work uh, out of that property. And am I able to share my screen? Um, absolutely. Uh, Ms. Rawson, can you go ahead and grant him permission? All right. You should be all set now. Great. Thank you very much. Give me one second. So in essence, uh, can you see this photograph that I have up there right now? So in essence, this is this is back uh, before the, my time that the client purchased the property. This is in the early 2010s, I believe. Uh, and what is exhibited here is the garage as it was originally constructed from 1963 up to uh, approximately 2019 or 20 of what it looked like. Um, Arlington Motor Mart operated uh, uh, vehicle service repair out of this garage and basically there would be vehicles stored on the property outside as well as along the side of the garage uh, in order to service vehicles were stored inside and outside. So the use has kind of changed over the years, but when my client purchased this property, it was mostly as a uh, uh, as a uh, auto um, service station as well as an auto body shop. The auto body shop, as I indicated, ended in 2020. Um, my client started doing some beautification to the property and applied uh, and obtained uh, permission to basically do some renovation work to the single family home. Uh, and at around the same time, they basically painted the uh, garage, uh, replaced the roof on the garage, and uh, uh, basically have made some significant improvements to, to kind of beautify the area. Uh, it's also during this period of time from 2020, uh, or actually when my client purchased the property, uh, he was also a owner of a property management company, uh, originally Barrington Management that merged with Briggs uh, LLC. Uh, they used a portion of the garage uh, for its maintenance divisions, for storage of materials, uh, use as a woodworking shop, and parking for commercial vehicles. Uh, they also had additional space and rented it to uh, a cleaning service that was um, basically a cleaning service that was a vendor for them that provided property management cleaning to their various properties as well as other properties that uh, operated their business out of here, stored their materials and trucks in this business as well. Uh, from 2022 to the present, the, the, that use uh, changed to basically primarily being a storage of property management vehicles and, and equipment. Uh, currently, my client, uh, when they basically in 2022, 2023, uh, they, as you can see in the rear area, you see the, um, the crew boats in the back there. The property that abuts uh, my client's property uh, is owned by the town and has historically been used for uh, back in the day. I know that there's vehicle storage on there, but currently they rent it to a crew company that stores their crew boats on there as well as other equipment. Uh, my client wanted to identify an actual buffer zone because it was kind of open to the point where it was unclear and uh, had discussions with the recreational department wherein they agreed uh, for my client uh, to provide some uh, landscaping and buffering to really identify that area. And in essence, what they did was they reduced the driveway uh, area, which was back in the day, fairly wide open, as you can see here, um, and then basically reduced the driveway portion of it and then basically installed gravel um, and also landscaping to kind of identify uh, the buffer area between the two properties. Uh, this was the plan in which they proposed to do with that property. Uh, he also has basically, this is the inside of the property now today. As you can see, it's no longer an automotive uh, service station. It's more of a wide open storage area, as we indicated, for storage of vehicles and materials. Uh, you can see the upper mezzanine that's in that area as well. And then basically, this is the office um, 
use that's within the building and and one of the bathrooms that's in there as well um let me go back to zoom stop sharing um my client is looking to my client is looking to sell the property at this point. And uh, in order to dot his I's, cross his T's, he wanted to make sure that the existing historical use of the property too, uh, if he sells it to somebody, that they can still maintain the existing uses of uh, storage of vehicles, uh, doing some light construction work uh, uh, and doing some additional uh, storage of vehicles and equipment. And basically the commercial office use could continue. And when I looked at your bylaws, uh, section 811A basically says that except as provided in this section, this bylaw shall not apply to structures or uses lawfully in existence or lawfully begun uh, prior to the December 14, 2017. However, if it's a pre-existing non-conforming structure or uses may be extended or altered provided no extension or alteration shall be permitted unless there's a finding by this board that such change is not more substantially detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing non-conforming use. So it's kind of in a pickle trying to figure out what is best best way to do it. I believe that there was conversations with the building inspector um, by my client, one of my client's representatives, and the uh, decision was to file with this board seeking clarification if this is actually a legal use, uh, which they can continue, or in the alternative, seek a special permit, basically seeking the permission to allow the historically uh, used to continue as it is so that if a buyer comes in, they can do that. If they choose to do anything significantly different than what the historical use has been, obviously they would need to come before this board uh, to basically uh, seek a pre-existing non-conforming uh, change to it. Um, we're not making any changes to the structure itself, no changes to the property, no nothing is going on. Uh, I know there was a request for some dimensional um, uh, information. Uh, we have uh, engaged a server near, excuse me, a surveyor, but uh, scheduling conflicts kind of got in the way and we were unable to basically produce that information. Uh, happy to basically provide that if the board feels that it is necessary for this, 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 this application to provide that information. But again, we are not looking uh, to ch make any changes at all. We're really just looking to clarify the historical use and if necessary, seek uh, permission from this board to continue with that use so that the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. And if the new buyer comes in, he or she or it understands exactly what they can or cannot do on that property. Because there has been some time period before since the board actually has been involved in and the mm -hmm. use that's been going on on this side. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so just quickly to, to understand. So the 196, so the 1963, uh, which is an appeal number 779, the board of appeals yes. uh, was to construct the building and it was done. So, and the owner was then the owner of the state coal and oil company yeah. um, and was seeking to use the, the building as a part of his business. But then in 1967, uh, they returned to the zoning board petition number 595 seeking yeah. a variance to change that use. And at that time, um, it was Harrington truck. Um, yeah. It's a, and the, at the time, so just to read from the, uh, from the decision, it says the Harrington concern presently consists of the owner and two employees. There is a pickup truck, which is the only vehicle owned by the business. The operation of the business does not involve any heavy work or noisy operations, nor is there yep. any appreciable traffic to the premises by customers or suppliers. Um, they will construct an office space, which you had identified. Uh, we use the rest of the building except for the offices. Uh, for equipment storage purposes. Uh, this is the unanimous decision of the board that the petition shall be allowed, authorizing the use of the premises for business purposes, substantially similar to those now being conducted by Harrington Equipment Company. So subsequent to that decision, has there been any other action by the town to amend yeah. uses? That, yeah, and that's when I basically pulled uh, the history of this uh, from, um, from the from the registry as well as information from the town the only information that we were able to find was this 1967 is the last action it appears that at some point in time the simonian family continued with the renting of it that turned into this major operation of an auto business at one point in time an auto body shop and um that i haven't 
I was unable to locate anything that basically allowed that. Uh, the purpose of what my client's looking to do is to go back to what was originally permitted on this, is storage of equipment and vehicles, similar to the, I believe that the 67 permit is kind of a continuation of the, allowing the use that was granted in 63, as well as allowing them to rent out to Harrington, which at that time was a company that was going to utilize a portion of the premises for uh, the storage of its, of, uh, of its equipment. So what we were looking to do is the historical use as far as we are concerned is basically the storage of that equipment, the ability um, to store vehicles and things along those lines. Uh, it's a substantial reduction of what was going on on this property prior to my client's purchase of it. Uh, and I'm not 100% sure how, why, or um, how it basically uh, continued on from 63. But my understanding that it was continuously used from 63, 67 to about 2020 or 2015 by the Simonian family uh, for commercial purposes. That's one of the main reasons I'm before you is I'm trying to really clean up this record as to what's permitted and what is allowed on this site. And uh, we're looking to do the less intensive use to, to really clarify that uh, and quite honestly, seek the ability to uh, continue with it so that there is a record going forward so that a new owner doesn't have the same kind of uh, question marks in their head as to uh, what the history of this site actually is. Okay. So it's your understanding of the 1967 decision that um, the, the, the garage unit was going to be shared by um, the Mr. Simeone, Simonian, who was resident at the house and to share it with the Harringtons or was there no... Yeah. Receipt? My understanding, it, yeah, my understanding is from the decision itself, 959, it's the uh, third, second paragraph up. The petitioner continues continues to use the relatively small portion of the building as business office space, but no longer uses the rest of the building for the purpose of which it was built. Uh, instead, he seeks approval of the rental of the premises to Harrington Equipment, which is a service business formerly located involved in industrial truck batteries and battery charging devices basically so it's tough to, from based on this record without actually seeing the application seeing everything it is i'm inferring right. from this that he continues uh, to he continues to use a small portion of it but he's also looking to rent it out and it appears that based on this decision over the years whether he went before the board whether he went for uh to, to, to the billing inspector to see if these additional uses that it kind of turned into uh during the 70s the 80s the 90s and the, and the 2000s um, it, it appears that it was is looked upon and classified as a residential commercial use, and these these uses just continued on. Um, so that's that's How's kind of the history that I've been to... able to kind of locate here. Okay. How is the residential building used today? How is the residential building used today? No. Uh, it's used as a residence, uh, and it's and in my and Nick, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's continued to be used as residence, I believe. Um, I think family members live there. Um, I know that they're moving. Um, Nick, do you have, uh, what's the current use of the residential building? Uh, well, cur currently it's empty, but we did have, uh, we built it as a, when we first took it over, it was a- uh, Residential. It was all residential. It was a three family. Um, the town had it listed as a three family in some areas and as a two family in others. Um, we, when we took over the property, there were three tenants in the property. Uh, we got rehabbed the entire building and we took it back with great expense and put it down to two units, which was more consistent with what the town had as record. And uh, we actually lived in the second and third floor and we rented the first floor. And then uh, at a later date, we rented the second and third floor and we moved down and used the first floor. And then over the summer, uh, our tenant moved out on August 1st. And so we then made the decision to look to market the property. And we've actually since moved out of the property. So currently the property is is marketable, but but vacant. Hey, Mr. Chairman? Uh, Mr. Hanlon? Um, I just wanted to note that uh, we're getting some activity in the chat. Yes. Uh, and that people should know that that doesn't become part of the record. We don't really rely on that and that if folks have something to say that there'll be a public comment period and they need to uh, say what they have to say during that period. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, 
At any time, was the residential house used for business purposes, as far as you're aware? No, not to my knowledge. I believe it was when we bought it from Simonian, he had three non family independent tenants in there. Okay. And as you had said, it's now it's now used as a two family. That is correct. Right. Um so from the from the record you've presented, it sounds like between there's been a variety of uses on the site with a variety of intensities. Um yeah. But that there had been no attempt to come back to the board seeking permission to change the use. Um, the use had just changed, and the the building had proceeded as it was. Yeah, and that's the unfortunate part. This is, you know, this is uh, uses primarily. These uses were basically done um, from you know 2063 all the way up to 2015 when I purchased my client when he purchased it and when my client purchased the property he was under the belief that the continued commercial use um, could continue on um, looking back on it now hiring counsel looking to basically sell the property we're actually taking he's really taking a belts and suspenders approach basically saying look you know there seems to be an issue with with this and I want to make sure I rectify uh, this going forward uh, because uh, quite honestly, the, the activity of the use that was there of the auto body shop and, and then municipal service, um, I, I'm surprised not to see anything in the record um, allowing that use to go. And I know it did go for a certain period of time, but they're not looking to continue that. They're looking to basically go back to primarily it's a it's a commercial garage that's used for storage of vehicles. And, and the the type of buyer that would be attracted to this be, you know, like a local construction person who wants to have an office. Uh, and the ability to store their vehicles and, and construction equipment and do some rainy day potential painting of materials and stuff in 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 the building. And that that's what they're looking to do. Uh, they're looking to have the least intensive use of what has historically been 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 done there. And and mm -hmm. we looked at the original permitting and believe that the the use that they're looking to do is is consistent with uh, with what that that garage was originally uh, constructed for. Oh, right. Not sure if I broke up. No. You you still hear me? I yes. Okay. Okay. Good. There. Um. Are there other questions from the board at this time? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um. I wonder if uh, Mr. Troyer has looked into the question. Uh, let's let's suppose that the I'm, as I do that the variance that was granted and then sort of regranted and amended in 1967 um, would allow a certain use, and that the applicant doesn't wish to go beyond the use that is set forth in the variance. And I understand that's the applicant's position, Mr. Troyer. Is that right? The applicant's position is to, so the original, so the original permit, and just bear with me, make sure I got it in my head, uh, allows house of vehicles and equipment for the business in which he was operating. Um, the, the battery storage that that not the battery storage, but the uh, the business that came on board that he rented it to, well, uh, and also for uh, commercial office use. Uh, the Harrington that came on board was also an office use to storage of equipment. What the plaintiff is looking to do, is, or excuse me, what the applicant is looking to do is to continue to use the commercial garage for commercial office use, uh, storage of vehicles and equipment, and the ability to do some light construction work in the property, which on a rainy day paint or do some. Um, you know, uh, some building uh, of uh, some very, very, very light construction material. That's all that so they're looking to do. If this was 1968, would it be your contention that that would be allowed by the document we have before us under uh, petition number 959? I believe that all. Both petition. I think you need to read them both together. Um, no, I get that. I understand yeah, yeah. that. But so, yes, you put with them both together. petitions, I would say that the use that he's seeking to do is consistent with what was granted to do. And then the uses that were done subsequent uh, to it 
would arguably uh, not have been permitted to, uh, to do that and unknowing the history of how those uses were ultimately uh, came to be i'm not sure yeah so but this let's, use let's assume that we let's assume that that there was no i mean we don't have any evidence that there existed any permission to extend the use after yeah. that point so let let's assume that the only thing that actually grants a right would be the two variance petitions that when read together they allow something and that's something you you and i can both read and figure out what it is uh it's not literally exactly what harrington was doing because it has to be substantially similar so i wouldn't imagine that these be violating his uh, var variance by hiring a third employee or anything like that and there may be some questions of interpretation about what the outer boundaries are yeah. when essentially the board didn't really try to describe the outer bound boundaries, but whatever it is, it, it would be something substantially similar to what Harrington is doing and what uh, Simonian was intending to do. It seems true that afterwards there was something that is at least a change of use yeah. and maybe also uh, an in substantial in intensification of the use. And that that carried on for a certain fairly substantial period of time. And I wonder if you've looked into what the implications are to an initially granted variance when somebody acting under the variance has exceeded its terms for a substantial amount of time. Is there an issue as to whether or not uh, that I, invalidated I, I, the initial variance? If, yeah, that's if, a good if, question. Was, I don't. I don't believe so because the, the, the continued uses, even though from what we have seen, um, they were office uses, both for the auto body service station. There's also construction of vehicles that were going on there. The increase of those uses uh, of operating an auto body shop and, and, and operating a vehicle repair shop in there would be, you know, basically something in which if a building inspector had gone on the property, they pr probably could have done enforcement requiring them to basically come in and, and ultimately seek additional permission to perform those services. But I think the key services from the original grants have always consistently from 1963 up to the present have been utilized. That is the storage of vehicles, commercial vehicles, uh, and the office use that's basically going on there. Uh, there but, may have been some increases to that to that use during during those periods of time, but I don't think it negates the original special permit. And well, even I guess the, the difficulty, Mr. Troyer, is that is that the language you're using characterizes and makes more abstract and therefore potentially broader what the board actually did. The board had before it a certain proposed use and it said that in anything substantially similar uh, would be yeah. okay. And, yeah. it's, and you were sort of, it's a question of what substantially similar means. But let me turn to your attention to section 8.1.1. Yeah. Uh, a section that we don't, the part of it that, that I'm interested in that is, that I wanted to get your views on is that, is the first sentence that the bylaws shall not apply to uses lawfully in existence or lawfully begun by a certain time. Yeah. Um, however, this bylaw shall apply to any change or substantial extension of such use. And that and then is is uh, uh, well. Let me just sort of let it stay there. Uh, but so arguably, there's a change of the use, and arguably, even if there's not a change of the use, if you treat it in generally as abstractly and so forth, there's an extension of the use in that they're doing a lot of stuff that wasn't really in the mind of was presented to the board originally and wasn't in it wasn't really approved of in their position yeah. and again i want to come back to the question is that if they've been violating the terms of the vi of the variance they have by not getting additional approvals uh, yeah. in order to deal with a change of use or an substantial expansion of the use whether you are aware of any authority that has any bearing on whether or not that and again, it's not your client that did this, but right, uh, no. whether that uh, causes yeah, the, the use to uh, be abandoned uh, or in some way, be abandoned or something like that. Yeah. I do note that the final sentence of this 
paragraph is, it is the purpose of this bylaw to discourage the perpetuity of nonconforming uses and structures whenever possible. Although I don't think that you have a nonconforming use under the terms of the bylaw. We can get to that in a second. Yeah. I think, you know, at the end of the day, I think basically to answer your first question, um, the the use that was done during the period of time uh, where it doesn't appear that any permission was sought, whether we just don't know, there's nothing in the record to demonstrate what happened after Harrington left the property. I believe it's pretty clear in the record that the original reason to construct this garage was for uh, storage of, uh, to, to operate a uh, office use out of there and storage of commercial vehicles, basically. And that, that's what the original permit was. And then the second one in 67 allowed them to rent it out to others to basically do that. And over the years, there was, arguably uses that were done that uh, were consistent with that, but they expanded on it. And to me, the bylaw basically part of part of what we're looking at here is, is this a legal use that can continue on? I think given the history and given the, op not the optics, but the facts of this dating back, how it has changed its uses over, over, the, over the years is the reason why I'm actually seeking, you know, also a special permit to basically find that the pre-existing non-conforming use of, uh, of the uh, commercial garage for storage of vehicles and for the office use um, is similar in nature to that. That's what they have. When my client purchased the property, that's in essence what they did. He had a property management company business. The auto industry ultimately did leave, but I think that there was lease terms that they had, they were under that basically, you know, things were fluid at the time, but he ultimately got the property to a point where, none of those illegal uses uh, were basically continued on. And the only use that he was making of it was the storage of vehicles for his property management company, as well as potentially renting out to a, not, not potentially, but renting out to a, to a cleaning service who was also using it for office purposes and storing equipment there. And he's looking to basically continue with that type of use, which I believe is consistent with the original use. And I don't think the, the, the illegal, not the illegal, but the, 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 the operations that were done by not coming back to the board would negate the original variance. What would, from a legal perspective, what, what would have happened is that property owner would have continued on. They didn't necessarily have a building permit to do the auto body business. They didn't have any real authority from the board to change that use or do anything. And a building inspector, um, if in fact this was brought to their attention, uh, could have had the opportunity to basically seek an enforcement action against them. And that that's where the action would go. It doesn't necessarily negate the original variances and, and, and permits that were granted, it would open up the door to a uh, enforcement action. Fortunately, my client has basically not waited for an enforcement action to be filed against them. They are actually looking to come to this board and say, hey, there's a history of this, this property that we can't figure out either. And we want to basically allow the, the history of, of what was permitted, the commercial use, to market this property to someone to basically make sure we dot our I's and cross our T's and clean up this record. And that's really why we're before you guys is right. trying to fix something that kind of went awry for, for many, many, many years in this property. And by doing that, I advised, I said, well, let's go back to what was originally permitted there and what you ultimately can do, which never really it, even though those uses were more substantial, they still had those basic premises of what they were doing. So I believe that arguably there's one way to look at this. Uh, it's a legal use because it was granted or worst case scenario, it's a pre-existing non-conforming use that's been going on for a significant period of time where we are proposing to the board to take away the, the, uh, the intensity of these uses and bring it back down to what was originally uh, looked to be done there and seek permission from his board to continue on. And you guys can place in the necessary uh, restrictions or conditions on uh, allowing that use so that it's clear going forward that it's, so whoever uses that property for commercial purposes now has a guideline as to what they can or cannot do with it. Yeah, so I get that. I, th I think that the problem that I have with a non-conforming use is that in order to be a prior non-conforming use, it has to have been established uh, before the provision of the bylaw that otherwise would prohibit it. And here that clearly didn't happen. That's why you got a variance in 1963. Uh, so really what we have here, as I understand it, is if you're not proposing a change of use now and asking us to endorse a change of use, and you're only asking us to basically reaffirm 
the use that is that you contend was already I'm uh, asking for that already was that it was was authorized by the bylaw that makes it a little bit simpler it is harder because we would not have today been able to grant the variance that you got in 1963 or your predecessor did right. um, so that makes it a little bit harder to do more than say well you got what you got yeah. Uh, but on the other hand, as I understand you, if you emerge from this hearing with with us having said nothing more than you got what you got, you've got those two documents that defines what your rights are. And that's all we can tell you um, that that would probably satisfy. You're not looking for any change beyond that. But if you are, you should tell us clearly what change you think may not have been authorized by the variances you have that you would like to would, that you would like to do now? I think the only change uh, potentially, I believe that the previous variances allow for the, uh, for the storage of commercial vehicles on the property, as well as in a garage, as well as commercial office use. And that can be done. And that's that's where I, I'm coming to. If there, once, there wasn't anything ever discussed, the battery business, whatnot, that the decisions are what the decisions are. So we don't know if they were doing any work inside the building or not. Uh, but... Uh, the only additional use, and I don't even know if you need a permit for this, is to do some light, um, you know, painting of uh, materials in, in, in the garage or whatnot. But the, primarily what my client is looking for, and correct me if I'm wrong, Nick, is, is basically the ability to uh, have somebody uh, basically utilize that garage for storage of vehicles as well as the ability to operate a, a commercial office use out of there that may be tied to that. And if need be, they can rent out that space as well to to vendors or other businesses that have similar um, types of uses. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm not an attorney, but I'll, I'll just take a plain sense approach to this. Um, <laughs> you know, when we inherited it, it had a fairly intense use. We asked for the body shop to leave. They left. Um, the mechanics had stayed on for a few more years and then they both retired. And we did follow this, the original guideline, which was to store vehicles. We did run an office. Um, occasionally, the maintenance guys did some light construction work in the, in the, inside the block building. Nothing compared to the noise impact of a body shop and a mechanics shop, which was quite loud. Um, uh, you know. And so I think that as owners, I think we've been a good steward of the property. I think we've taken it, we've renovated it, we've cleaned it up. It was a mess when we bought it, to be blunt. We cleaned up the shop. Um, we pulled permits for everything. We put a new roof on it. We pulled a permit for that. We pulled a substantial permit to do the rehab of the, of the house itself. We spent a great amount of funds on beautifying the landscaping. And when the crew, which quite frankly has a dramatic impact on the town property, and it was impacting us, that's when we went to uh, that's when we went to the uh, recreational department, which was in charge of that lot. And we asked if we could put in the buffer zone, which we were permitted to do again at our own expense with no contribution from the town. And um, but to sell the property with a, a 33,300 3, square foot block building, it, it has to go to someone that's going to use it for some level of commercial use and either live or rent in the front property. I, I just don't see how we can, we can vary from that. I also think that uh, by taking out the parking lot, we've limited the amount of vehicle storage that's able to be done outside. So it can only be done in inside, maybe a vehicle or two outside for the house and also for the commercial operation, but you can't stack up 10 vehicles literally uh, in that driveway. Now it's more of a residential driveway. Um, I, I do have some concerns about limiting the number of employees because when we ran it, um, you know, I had 10 employees that would filter in and out during the normal business day. Uh, and then we'd store some of the trucks there and some of the trucks went home. Uh, and that was both for the cleaning enterprise and for the maintenance and construction enterprise. So um, I think we've been a good neighbor. Um, I think we've been a great neighbor. I think we've improved things for the neighborhood. Um, and I just think that, you know, we can't, we need to have a use defined so we can move forward with the sale because I can't bring someone to the table to make an offer without a clear cut understanding as to what they can use 
uh, the building for. And so I don't think what we're asking for is unreasonable. I think we're asking for a general consistency, which was, uh, which was what was originally granted in 1963 and 1967. Does that mean I'm going to store two oil trucks or three oil trucks, which was Simonian's original request? That's a very limited sale to an oil company, and I don't think the neighbors want an oil company in there. And I certainly don't think, from an environmental standpoint, I want a battery company in there. So we're talking about just light construction storage. There's tons of contractors in town that might be interested in it because of the lack of uh, of good office and workshop space in the town, especially with what's going on up in the Heights with the uh, uh, the loss of a lot of the uh, uh, stuff over behind the old mill because of what uh, Myrac's done. So we're just trying to, again, uh, find something that will be um, an acceptable use in consistency with what we've used it for in the past, whether it was 100% in compliance with the 1963-1967 use or not. Because if we pigeonhole it that way, it's going to be a very conf very finite use. I think Doug has articulated very well that, you know, you got an office, we'll use the office. You'll have some employees come and go, that's normal. You'll have the parking of vehicles, that's normal. Um, but it's not a retail, it's not gonna have uh, any kind of uh, retail traffic. It's just gonna be the door goes up at, you know, 7 a.m., the trucks roll out, and at 3.30, they come back in, and that's pretty much the end of it. It's That's how commercial operation works. That's how we worked. And uh, I never received a complaint of our, um, operation while we did it from any of the neighbors. I knew most of the neighbors personally, and um, I think they would agree we did a pretty good job. Thanks, Nick. Thanks. So um, you had mentioned this buffer zone that, that has been created. So that's on the town's property, is that correct? That is correct. So what? where is the property line relative to the side of the garage? It's about three feet off. There's a copy of the plot plan in the materials that Doug presented. And that's why I said we did work on town property at our own expense to create our own buffer zone. Okay. But then, so you are maintaining paving now to the property line. It's always the way it was. Okay. Nope, just looking to confirm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so the... Yeah. And the, the housing unit has two parking spaces? Or how do you manage parking for them? I'm sort of trying to get a sense as to what the total parking configuration is on the site. Typically, it would be two two cars, one for each unit. That, and if they want, they could probably squeeze a third, but two cars. Are there other questions from the board? Seeing none, I will note that there are um, a few letters that have been put into the record. Um, and if those uh, if those residents are are here, I'm going to open the meeting for public comment in a minute. Um, you know, they should feel free to bring uh, bring those to our attention. Um, Excuse me, I'm I'm I, I don't understand what the ask is right now. I'm okay. one of the people who submitted a letter. I will tell you in one second. Okay. No. So um, in a minute, I'll be opening the meeting for public comment. So public questions and comments are taken as they relate to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing its decision. Members of the public will be granted time to ask questions and make comments. Members of the public who wish to speak should digitally raise their hand using the button on the reaction tab in the Zoom application. Those calling in by phone can dial star nine to indicate you would like to speak. You'll be called upon by the chair, asked to give your name and address for the record. And given time for your questions and comments, all questions are to be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly. For anyone wishing to address the board a second time during any particular hearing, the chair will allow those wishing to speak for a first time to be called upon first. Once all public questions and comments have been addressed, 
the public comment period will be closed and we will do our best to show any documents if they are relevant to what you would like to say. Uh, so if there are members of the public who wish to address the board, if you could go ahead um, and in the react tab, if you, uh, you can raise your hand there. Uh, so we have our first uh, is uh, Paul Creeden. If you go ahead, give your name and address for the record and uh, make us your comments. Hi, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Paul Creeden. I reside at 911 Pond Lane, Unit 11, um, across from the property at 20 Pond Lane. Yeah. Um, so I want to I want to start uh, by saying that uh, the plan the applicants for this have been great neighbors. Um, they've been very respectful, used in the space in um, in a way that caused no issues. My concern is what happens when ownership of the property changes and the definition that is set forth in the decision made today allows someone to move into that property and set up a commercial uh, space that uh, has a negative impact on the on the neighborhood. And um, basically it boils down to two issues that I'm concerned with. The first one is traffic safety. So we're a residential street, but we serve as a cut through between Mass Ave and Pleasant Street. It's There's a lot of traffic that's brought through this residential street. Traffic enforcement is um, it's basically non-existent on our street. Uh, when it's convenient, cars will park on the sidewalk. They will park on the street in front of my property. They will park um, blocking driveways. And my concern is a different commercial enterprise will out of convenience say, well, I'm just loading something. So I'm gonna park on this sidewalk for an hour and unload my vehicle. Uh, it's a residential area. It's really not designed for an increase in commercial traffic. So even if the property was just used for equipment storage and vehicle storage, those vehicles need to enter the property and leave the property. Um, that happens where my daughters walk to school. Um, it happens on our street where we're trying to pull out into traffic and it's extremely busy. So as I said, the, the applicants are very respectful and they're great neighbors. I'm worried about future neighbors not um, being as considerate. The other concern I have is as far as I can see, and I'm not, I don't live in the world of zoning, light construction isn't defined as a term that I can find. So light construction could mean painting to someone, but it could also mean angle grinding or machine assembly, just like an auto body shop. As far as I can see, there's only the definition of light constru construction versus heavy construction, heavy construction being excavation. So if it was defined in some way that light construction just meant painting, then I would be okay with the application. However, the, even the idea of wo a woodworking space that you know adds noise and exhaust to our neighborhood, which again is a residential neighborhood. You know, my children play out front right across from the property no issues right now, but if there was a metal working shop in there, you know, in a year, then I'm going to have issues with a commercial enterprise being right across from, you know, a residential property. It's a, it's an interesting street that we only have a few single family or multifamily homes and large condo buildings. Um, but for those two reasons, you know, I'm, I'm really concerned with the, this definition of allowing for light construction and uh, equipment storage. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you very much. I appreciate you appearing. Um, next on our list is uh, Michael Simidar. Hello and good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Michael Simada. I'm, we recently purchased the property across the street from the applicant at 15 Pond Lane. Um, and we are currently also making improvements to our home as we are seeing this as uh, our forever home and we are planning to stay there for decades to come. Um, we are also expecting a child right now and that's kind of part of the reason why I'm speaking here today because uh, my concerns are also for me, myself, my family and the investment that we made in this property just recently. Um, again, I wanna echo 
uh, Mr. Creedon's uh, words by saying that we had no issues whatsoever with the neighbors so far. On the on the contrary, our dogs are very friendly with each other, and we've had several conversations in the past. We are happy for them um, to moving um, outside of state and and kind of finding uh, uh, a place for their family. Um, my concerns are very similar to Mr. Creedon's. What comes after that, right? Because uh, so far the um, the use has been very inconsistent at this property, um, and I think also from the presentation today, it was very unclear to me what even the applic applicants are trying to accomplish with the property. Uh, there has been the talk about um, re restoring whatever has been granted back in 1963-1967. There, The application, however, reads as well that uh, added scope uh, of light construction work uh, is uh, part of the applicant's uh, request. Uh, and it's very confusing to me what is actually on the table today. Uh, number two is, um, again, light construction work. What does this mean? Um, I think there's no limits to this set. Uh, and even the experience from previous businesses as we are talking uh, to our neighbors was that uh, commercial vehicles left the property on a daily basis as early as 6 a.m. in the morning, which clearly causes a nuisance to neighbors who are trying to sleep in uh, uh, until 7, 8 uh, uh, or, or after that, right? So having commercial traffic starting at 6 in the morning is already a nuisance. How can this be limited? I don't, I don't know. I don't know if this uh, board even has the authority to that. But it inevitably will come if there's a commercial business residing in there, especially when it comes to a fluid business that requires uh, to come in and out on a daily basis. I think the original permit, as it was stated, was primarily for storage. It was not for um, vehicles to come and go on a daily basis, right? Uh, this is a major difference, uh, I think, in the interpretation of uh, whatever was granted back in '63. Uh, storage and hiding equipment out of sight is different than operating a business on a daily basis uh, with moving traffic, especially on our street where we have already a lot of traffic. And I think also because it was mentioned or cited earlier when it comes to 8.1.1 in the zoning bylaws, and I want to finish kind of the paragraph because this was left out at the bottom, it is the purpose of this bylaw to discourage the perpetuity of non-confirming uses and structures whenever possible. And I wanna really drive this home as well because 1963 is 61 years ago. Um, and um, in addition to that, I think other concerns that are coming is that regulation has changed, right? And any other business that might be moving into this, uh, I think there has been a history not only of non-permitted use, but also of businesses not applying for uh, occupancy permits. So, so far, those businesses that have been operating in there also ha didn't have um, occupancy permits uh, associated to that, uh, to the use of the space. Um, so there's no clear understanding of what is this, what can this building, what type of business can it actually house as it is, permit, uh, as it is permitted. Right, especially when it comes to commercial use. Uh, I'm thinking about when the example is coming with paint work, like what about air filtration? How is the air blowing out of the building, right? Um, what about uh, noise abatement solutions, right? When it comes to angle grinding, welding, other, uh, these types of activities. Are those activities to be expected on the weekends? Are those activities expected to be early in the mornings? Uh, all of these issues, I think, that are not really constrained at this point, together with the inconsistency in, ter in terms of what is the proposed use in the future. Uh, I understand that the applicants don't really know today because they are trying to sell the property. And um, it is great that they are trying to get the clarity at this point. Um, my question is also, why not nine years ago when the property was bought? Why today? And why, why didn't it happen already nine years ago? Um, and I think also I want to come back to the argument of abandonment, right? Especially when it comes to the illegal uses over the last decades of the property. Um, returning back to a non-conform use after several decades, I think is a clear case of abandonment, uh, in this case of the original permits. Uh, and I would much rather see a new application of this. Again, 
the the applicants are nice people, nice neighbors. The way how to use the property for the short uh, period of time that we've been there, it's been very pleasant, right? There haven't been any issues. Uh, we are primarily worried about what is going to come next, and this uncertainty cannot be uh, answered by uh, giving a a unconstrained permit in the future. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, sorry. With that, I want to yield and uh, thank you very much for your time and um, um, for allowing me to speak today. Absolutely. Thank you very much. I appreciate you being here. Are there other members of the public who wish to address this hearing? Everybody, one last chance. Seeing none, I will go ahead and close up. Oh, perfect timing. Um, we have a Jay Cronin. If you could just name and address the record, please. If you're speaking, we cannot hear you. Oops, you are muted now. You are unmuted, but do not hear you. Um, so I know Mr. Hanlon had said earlier that we would not be using, uh, we typically do not use the, uh, the chat. I, I note that, um, while this individual is having trouble with their audio, they do appear to be able to use the chat. Do you think that would be acceptable to take testimony in that fashion if we then captured the chat? Mr. Chairman, I think that I think that's possible. We can. It certainly um, it certainly is preferable to not letting a person share his views with us. the The chat now indicates that uh, Mr. Cronin can call on the phone. Maybe that would be preferable. That'd be great. Yeah, if you could try the the phone, we'll go ahead and hold. I didn't want to assume that it was Mr. Cronin. Incidentally. In case they don't have the number, I just put the phone number and the meeting ID into the ch chat. Mm Ah. 
Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for letting me uh, speak. Um, my name is John Cronin. Um, I'm a resident of Wyman Terrace. Um, and I understand the use of the building. Um, just as a point of reference, um, when that building was constructed behind it in the land that the town owns, there used to be a plumbing supply store there. It took the uh, occupancy of the old uh, ice house that was there. So it was a thriving commercial business with lots of traffic and tractor trailers and, and a wholesale and retail uh, plumbing supply store. And where the apartment building is now, the condos, that was an Anderson window um, a manufacturing company. So Pond Lane has been a pretty busy commercial street over time. I believe that the um, 20 Pond Lane was, was created knowing that it was a very um, busy commercial area and that it was used for the uh, oil and um, fuel oil company for parking and for their storage. But later on, it was, uh, it got converted to the Arlington Motor Mart and I think they were there from 1967 on. The reason I know that is I was an employee of the Arlington Pipe and Supply until it to come to a tragic fire in 1970. But the uh, uh, motor mart's been there, the principles have changed, but they've been there since at least 68, maybe 67. So I think they've been good, good neighbors and, and, and good um, citizens in the neighborhood. I realize that no one likes a lot of traffic, but there's significantly less traffic there now than there was 60 years ago as I recall, growing up and, and playing in that neighborhood and being friends with the people who lived in the house in front of the garage. Um, but the garage looks great. Um, clearly, I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of industry there. Um, and I think that the applicants, I think they're, they're doing the right thing. They're asking to clarify the use of the building. I mean, over time, that building was inspected by the assessor's office and by public safety. They had um, petroleum products stored there. They had some uh, waste products they were taking care of. So, you know, no one was operating under the radar there. Um, it was clear, clearly a use. And I dare say that a number of our town employees and public safety people used were customers of that garage. So it wasn't under the radar. And I know they were good, um, good neighbors because my property almost abuts them, and I was a customer of them. So. I just want to speak in support. I, I, I think the applicants have the best, have the best uh, thoughts in, in line here. I think they're just trying to clarify the use of the building for the next group. And I'm sure that if, if it doesn't conform with whatever you provide, then that entity will come back to the, uh, to the board for further clarification. But um, I just think I think we should. I think you should consider letting it go ahead and um, let the applicant get the um, permit they need, so they can uh, let somebody else use the space. It's great space. It's a great location, and I don't think it will be that busy, especially if you go back to what it used to be. With it used to be tractor trailers delivering um, inventory to the Arlington Pipe and Supply. There were lots of trucks picking up and dropping off supplies, including. Uh, all the plumbing supplies and, and soil pipe and everything else. Um, and it was a very busy street. And I understand it's not that now. Even with the Anderson window, there were tons of deliveries being made to that that uh, that complex that was there. So I don't want any more traffic, and I think we've been benefiting from what what's there now. But I think the continued use of that building, the clarification of, of letting the um, landlords or the homeowners mm -hmm. or the um, use it and continue its its use, I think it would be would be a good thing. Um, that's my opinion. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them, but uh, thank you for the time. Thank you, Mr. Cronin. Appreciate you. Mr. Chair? Yes, it's, um, who is that? Uh, Doug Troyer. Oh, yes, Mr. Troyer. Um, Mr. Cronin, do you mind identifying your address? I'm sorry, I didn't catch it. Um, I currently live at 29 Wyman Terrace. But previous to that, I lived at 33 Wyman Terrace. Thank you very much. And have so, 
and have so since 1953. Great. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Are there any other members of the public who wish to address the hearing? Seeing none, I'll go ahead and close this hearing for public comment. I do appreciate the members of the public who spoke with us today. Um, so what the board has before it, um, I have a, a, an application for special permit under 811A, um, but it, it seems more that what the applicant is really seeking is some clarification on what if, they're currently allowed to do on the site. If I uh, can, if I may uh, clarify what exactly we're looking for. Um, basically, because, because it's unclear, uh, basically, my position is that the storage of commercial vehicles and the ability to operate a commercial office use out of that garage is permitted as a right. It's legal. Uh, it was granted, and prior to December 14, 2017, that use uh, basically can continue on. And if they look to enlarge it or change that use into doing other things, they would need to basically seek a special permit. Uh, for a pre-existing non-conforming use because in essence, if, even though it's legal, it, it's a, it's a pre-existing non-conforming use because they needed a variance in our special permit. But because um, they, if they want to expand upon that, uh, they would basically need to, to, to seek a special permit. The other thing in which we were looking for is, look, because it has been such a long time, take the opportunity to identify what exactly uh, uh, use basically of this uh, can be made of it. And it's our position that the use of uh, storage of commercial vehicles, as well as the ability to run a commercial office out of there, uh, can continue on. And if, in fact, if the light construction aspect of it is, is causing confusion, then maybe that is a that is uh, basically something in which we can discuss further as to whether or not it's necessary to uh, further identify what that is or what it would be. But can the so basically it's really can the board make a determination that the uh the 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 use as it has been utilized over the years can be continued to be used as storage of commercial vehicles uh and also commercial office use um so that the client can basically market and sell the unit that if anyone wants to go in there and expand upon those types of uses they need to come to the board and specifically identify exactly what that use will be so i'm kind of in a conundrum as to what is the best way to do it and open to uh thoughts and suggestions from the board as to what your pleasure is all right thank you um and mr Hanley, you had spoken a little bit to this before um <clears throat> It's a little tricky for the board to put together a laundry list of of uses that w that could be allowed on the site. Um, we do have two documents, uh, two prior decisions of this board that sort of provide some guidance, but don't provide a you know a large amount of guidance um, as to what could be used on the site. I don't know if it's more helpful for the board to. Um, discuss a little bit what they sort of imagine was intended by these prior decisions are things that could be operated on the site and how the, what may, what would be, have been appropriate uses of the land at that time? Um, or should we be thinking a little bit more about, you know, what, we, what are, what we think would be the optimum use today? It, my feeling is that we, you know, obviously we do have these legal, legally binding documents in front of us that describe how the property is supposed to be used. Um, and I definitely, you know, hearing from the the neighbors, the the use was substantially more intensive in the past, um, and is much less so today. Um, and certainly the the uses that were envisioned in 1963 and 1967 were more in keeping with some of the other businesses that were still in use. Right. Um, in that area at the time and where those businesses are no longer there, um, this property in some ways is a little bit, you know, anachronistic in terms of, 
use in that area, but it is a legal use uh, for this land. And so um, I, I think sort of looking to the board to see sort of what their, what their sense is as to how they would want to proceed, whether we yeah. think in our interest to um, <clears throat> help better define what businesses yeah. would be, would make sense or whether we should be thinking more along the lines of um, just sort of sticking with, with what's in the written record to date and moving from there. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, <clears throat> the way I look at this is <clears throat> that the question of prior non-conforming uses is a non-issue. Uh, because for the reasons I stated earlier, this is not and never has been a prior non-conforming use. The original re variance was precisely because, as the board stated at that time, the denial of the permit by the Inspectional Service Department was automatic, as they say, because it was flatly forbidden by the bylaw. So already in 1963, the commercial use we're talking about here was was uh, not inconsistent with the bylaw. And so the provisions we have on prior non-conforming uses just don't apply. Um, we do, however, have a document which is somewhat unclear um, as to what its outer boundaries are that provide an authorization to, that provide an authorization to use uh, to, to for some kinds of commercial uses. And it seems to me that the main thing that the applicant needs uh, and sort of where I'm starting from is that in today's real estate market, you need more clarity on what the 1963 and 67 documents actually actually mean. And the people who spoke to us also need more clarity as to what it means. Uh, a good example is the question about the incidental painting or something, which was not really directly addressed by those documents and that we don't really know what the board thought about that. Um, and so clarifications can go either way. Uh, the one thing that seems to me to be helpful is to treat this as a way of clarifying the permission already granted and maybe limiting it in some ways and and uh, letting it go and others. I have in mind, there are lots of things that are potentially of interest here. Uh, one would be uh, hours of operation, which are a traditional, uh, a traditional kind of condition that could be worked out. And it seems to me that if we're able to sort of say, look, we're willing to clarify, we want to stick within the general framework that is established by what we already have. We don't want to envision here an application for a change of use unless the applicant wants to be very clear on what the change of use is and what the authority we have is to authorize a change of a change of use. Uh, but we do have the ability to sort of look at what at an ambiguous decision, make it clearer, set it make it clear among other things by using conditions to say, you can do this, you can do that. You can't do woodworking. You can't do anything that uses hazardous chemicals. You can do certain other things. And to frame this in a way that stays within the framework that we already have, but makes it clearer so that whoever wants to buy this property knows exactly what they're 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 getting into that may mean that some things that the applicant thinks that it may be able to do under the original variances uh, would be precluded but the advantage to the applicant would be that they'd have a clear set of contours that helps make the property marketable rather than having to market it to somebody who has to come back to us, which is always a fearsome prospect, and it explain to us that why they ought to be able to do the things that, that they would like to do. And I'd sort of like to proceed in that framework. And it seems to me it would be helpful to decide just how important this so-called incidental painting is and what it would mean and whether it could be subject to limitations that uh, that would be more or less consistent with what has already been permitted and at the same time provide reassurance to the neighborhood that uh, it would not be sort of the camel's nose under the tent for an undesirable extension of, of, of the use. Um, 
And I think actually that if the applicant had an opportunity to talk to some of the people uh, that talked to us today and, and could work out a set of frameworks that everybody was happy with and that we were happy with, and again, that stuck within the framework of what has already been allowed, because I want to start from there uh, and are not looking to expand it. I think that once you get into expanding it, I'm, I'm very nervous about the fact that we could not grant this by this variance today. It would be flatly illegal under the state authorizing act. We could not do it because there's no question about shape and topography and those things, which are all after 1975 essential for us to grant a variance. And I'm not even sure what our authority is to actually amend the variance in a way to change it substantively. But I do think that we probably have the ability to turn back and to clarify it. And yes. if we stay within that framework, we would be able to do that within with within contours that the, the law gives us and enable us to craft something that would work better for the applicant, that would work better for the applicant's neighbors. And that frankly has to take into consideration that was was a very important thing in 1963 is that this was a better use in 1963 in the middle of what was essentially a commercial industrial neighborhood than whatever was there before. And it's not a commercial industrial neighborhood anymore. So even for that reason, we might not be able to grant it today. And it makes amending it or doing anything to extend it something that is really hard for us to figure out. But again, clarifying it and working out something that makes it fit within the neighborhood as it currently is while working basically within the structure we already have is something that I think we could do and that I think would be legally sustainable. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Um, yeah, it definitely is a, a good way to proceed. Are there other members of the board who have Mr. wish Mr. to add Chair. to this? Mr. Holly? Yeah, um, I was just looking at the bylaws, section 8.1.4, um, non-conforming non structures other than the single family or two family. Um, and again, it's, um, it talks about not the you know the use group of the lot, but just talks about the non-conforming structures other than you know single or two family. Um, it it gives us four you know rules or criteria there saying in any non-conforming structure may be altered and the on and the conform may be altered and the conforming use extended throughout the altered position provided that any resulting alter alteration shall not cause the structure to further violate you know blah, 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 and no building area or floor area where already non-conforming shall be increased so as to create a greater non-conformity, right? I mean, um, and then there's you know, further elaboration on item C and D. Um, so with with already the restriction on non-conforming structures being present in an R2 or, you know, or in a, I forget the zone, R3 um, lot, right? Um, we're not changing the, or we're not trying to establish a different use group, but I, I, I was of the opinion that if we can, there is industrial, light industrial use in the bylaws, but established rules for that use to a structure present in a residential lot is how I'm seeing it just to keep it within the, within the bylaws itself. And mm -hmm define the structure to that use group and have some restrictions on that. That, that. That's how I was contemplating as a solution for this one. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Hanley. I, wonder, I just, I, th I think that, I mean, I, I understand what Mr. Holly is saying. I just want to be clear that nonconformance is defined in the bylaw and it's defined as a condition that occurs when a lot structure, building, sign, development, or land use that legally existed before the effective date of this bylaw or any amendments to it does not conform to one or more of the regulations that currently applies to the district in which the lot structure, building, sign, development, and so forth is applied. And the law is pretty clear that something that is allowed by a variance, at least the use that's allowed by a variance, is not a prior not is not a non-conforming use. So the provisions of 8.1.4 are not aimed at 
at what you can do relating to a variance that has already been granted. But what happens if you had established that use when it was fully legal and then the bylaw had been changed to make it illegal? And that isn't what happened here. So by its terms, it doesn't really apply. Uh, and I think that we are sort of stuck with in my view, at least, we're stuck with what would happen if the applicant was just coming in and asking us to amend the variance. Mm -hmm. And what I was suggesting is that while I'm not sure we could am allow an amendment of a variance when the variance itself was not consistent with current law, uh, I do think that we could clarify the variance and that much of what is needed in order to work out a workable solution to the problem that the applicant and the neighbors have can be done within that framework. Uh, I do think that it's important to notice that a change of use doesn't is not defined by you know industrial use or some other things in the in in the bylaw. Uh, you know, changing something from a retail from yeah. a small store to a to a a, a miracle mart. Uh, would be a change of use, even though they're both retail. Uh, it's a much more malleable concept than that. So we are not required to sort of look at everything that and say everything that might be allowed for a light industrial use could be allowed here. Uh, we are capable and should uh, be looking at a much more finely tailored description of what it is that is allowed. And again, I think that a point of departure should be uh, the thing that has already been allowed and that is going to continue to be authoritative even if we did nothing we're not we can't actually revoke that variant so we're starting with it and the question is what is exactly does it does it mean and how can we work out something that makes it clear and, and that also makes it acceptable to everyone so mr handel what do you think would be a good way to begin sort of generating a starting point from which to have this discussion. Um, I mean, we could all certainly today put, you know, forward some different ideas and some different thoughts about what might make sense. But I, I, what you had mentioned earlier, where perhaps we asked the applicant to, um, to consider what some of those conditions might be that would uh, help to further define what exactly would be allowed on the property and to possibly have them have that conversation um, in conjunction with uh, with some conversations with the neighbors to come up with a, a reasonable set and then to have them come back before the board um, with with a, a essentially come back to the board with a proposition for what might make sense for this property and then that would give some that would give the board a place to begin its deliberations um, whereas at the moment we don't have a place to start. That is sort of where, I mean, obviously we can sit down and do it too, but I think it would be better for the, if the applicant who's already been clear as to like two things are essential, the office and the parking, the vehicles. The question really is what other uses, if any, uh, should be allowed in, and in general under what circumstances. So that if we, yeah. again, I would leave things like hours of operation, which is something that somebody raised, uh, as things that ought to be considered as as ways of uh, and there should be some flexibility in there, but I think we I think it, it is preferable for the applicant to come up with something that is a clear statement and that would be satisfactory to them and to work it out and to have it discussed it with others and have others come back and say what they think about it too. And then that gives us a document we can begin working with to try to fine tune to uh to achieve you know the objective of of creating a, a framework that that can redefine the framework that already exists be be more affordable more enforceable and more reliable to for everyone that that's ultimately what the town's objective is is to make it all workable in a way that obviously it has not been even in the past and certainly is not being workable for the applicant now mr chair mr chair um, is it possible if uh, we basically put together uh, a draft of uh, certain conditions kind of outline um, amending, not amending, but clarifying the original variances? Is there any representative of the town? Because normally I would be able to communicate, uh, maybe forward a draft and have a communication uh, kind of idea, see if we're on the right track or whatnot, so that we're not wasting time um, at actual board hearings. It, would there be a representative that I'd be able to provide it to to see if I'm 
on the right page or not on the right page so that when we do appear before this board, uh, we have a at least a, a working document to which we can talk about going forward. That is a great question. Um, I'm trying to like think where the right position like, for that, whether that would be under inspectional services or whether that would be under legal department. Yeah, it could be legal. It could be that when I do special permits for planning boards and things like that, I'm able to talk to the town planner, kind of throw some mm -hmm. ideas. What What do you think? What's this? What not? Informally, obviously, and then basically right. have an have an idea of if if we're in the in addressing what the board is actually looking for, so that what we present to the board is actually a, a document that right. you guys can basically pile through. Here, I'm just trying to see, is there somebody who I may be able to have that type of conversation with uh, on an informal basis or a formal basis, uh, just to make sure I'm on the same page of what we're looking to do. And then the other thing I love, if, if the board is asking us to potentially talk with the abutters, I love to get their, um, uh, I could give them my email so that they could forward um, any and all emails to me so that we can have uh, potential communications because there are three of them. I'd be happy to talk to the three that talk tonight. I'm trying Mr. To Chairman. Yes, Mr. Hanlon. I, 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 just as a possible solution, there really isn't any legal. I mean, what I think that the, I think that a conversation with Mr. Champa would be more useful than uh, than the conversation with Mr. Cunningham at this point. Uh, what we have is a document. There's no, it is what it is. It's it's its contours are what they are. There's nobody around today except possibly Mr. Cronin, who mm -hmm. knows what might have gone into that. And so it's really hard to put the lawyers in the position of figuring out. And really what we're trying to do is to do something practical within the broad framework of the document that we see. Um, and I think that that from that point of view, uh, Mr. Champa's area of expertise is probably more relevant to the applicant than just legal expertise is. Yeah. Um, and so I would encourage him to deal with Mr. Champa on that. Okay, great. Um, Mr. I'll, Mr. Chair, quick, uh, Mr. Holly, question. This is more a question. Is n now if the non-conforming use has been now changed to, if I may, a permitted use, is that how we're qualifying this, it, or is it still subject to a special permit use? It, it it's a, it's permitted by a variance, and it has whatever goes along with the variance. Right now there are no particular conditions to it, but it is a but it is a permitted use by a variance. It is not it is not really subject to the special permit situation, though I don't think. I think that ultimately what we are going to emerge from here is something that is an amendment to the variance. But that may be something that we need to consult with legal on. The legal yeah, because what if, you know, someone comes and and in the future, petition or applicant may say this, you know, I want to modify and apply for another variance. Well, you can modify you variances. There's no question about that. It's, I mean, again, it's the material in, in a, section 8.1 is aimed at a different problem. Here, the problem is that you've already got a, a document, as official action that is binding on the town that establishes that, that, the very that the normal bylaw is waived, subject to whatever conditions are applied to it. Anybody can we have as a standard condition to all these things that we have continuing jurisdiction, and people come back can come back and seek modifications of it, and and they do. Uh, I I and I think that that in effect is what we have is a, is what we have going on here, and that the ultimate document that we come up with would be a modification or an amendment uh, or restatement of the of the variance that we that was already provided and that stays within the framework of the what was already provided that's at least the idea that i have okay just for the record I, my position differs a little bit, uh, but I, I'm in agreement with Mr. Halen is, is proposing, and I think that is a, a good first step to kind of take a clarifying the variance in which is in. But my position on the pre-existing non-conforming is, is basically uh, it's a use that was allowed uh, to be done. Um, 
it was granted by a special permit variance. It's even unclear if this was a special permit variance back in 63, to be honest with you. But um, for purposes of, of moving forward, I think it does make sense to have a conversation to, and it may make the most exp expedient way is to identify exactly, clarify exactly what can or cannot be done there. And it, it seems like the board is in agreement that uh, storage of commercial uh, vehicles as well as commercial office use is, is permitted. Um, and, you know, if we can get clarification of that, and then if someone actually wants to do something that's beyond those uses, uh, then needs to come back and, and either amend the permit further, or I believe that they would have the option to come under a pre-existing non-conforming special permit. But I don't need to make that argument right now. Okay. I, to sort of to, to follow up on this, so I can get in contact with uh, with Mr. Champ in the morning and sort of let him know what our um, that he will be contacted by Mr. Troyer, um, who will provide sort of a an outline of some uh, possible conditions that would clarify the scope of the original uh, grant from 1963 and 1967. Um, and they can have those conversations. And then the next, the board's next meeting is get is set for November 12th. Um, so we would then be able to uh, continue this conversation uh, with that in hand at, at that date. Um, if we were to do that, we would be looking, that would be November 12th. So we would like to have documents in hand by noon on the 7th. Excellent. Any okay. further what, any further questions or comments from the board? Anything further from the applicant? No, the only thing I would want to mention is uh, the neighbors in which we've identified. Uh, you can get my email address from the filings that are online. Uh, I'm at uh, dtroyer at pierceatwood.com. Right. Thank you. And if you, anyone who's, uh, if you go to the the announcement and you end up on Novus looking at uh, the hearing information for this hearing, if you uh, select the application, um, it is there in the upper right corner. Um, this is Thank the you, contact Mr. information. For Thank you. Uh, so with that, uh, the chair would accept a motion to continue the public hearing for docket three. 822 20 Pond Lane, the Tuesday, November 12th, 2024, at 7 30 p.m. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. And a second. By end. Thank you, Mr. Riccadelli. So, vote of board members who are present. Uh, Mr. Hanlon? I say, I mean, yes. <laughs> Mr. Holly? Yes. Mr. Riccadelli? Yes. Ms. Hoffman? Yes. Mr. LeBlanc? Yes. And the chair says yes. Uh, so we are continued on uh, 20 Pond Lane. Thank you all very much for your time this evening. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you in November. Thank you very much. Have a great evening, everybody. Thank you all. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. your time. Welcome. Okay, so as we have just discussed, we have uh, now continued two items to Tuesday, November 12th. Uh, <laughs> Ms. Ralston, I believe we have two other items that are already on the docket for November 12th. Is that correct? That is correct. We have 232 Mass Ave coming back yep. um, in a different capacity this time. And uh, the other one is 15 West Street. And those are the two that'll be added to those other two. And then we have two more for the 26th of November. Too. Okay. Yep. So our two November meetings, November 12, November 26, and then we only have one meeting in December, which will be December 10th. Yes. Because we're not going to meet on the 24th. I don't know why we could have a party. <laughs> Uh, so just a couple other th things in concluding tonight. Um, 
I'd like to congratulate uh, Roger Dupont, Venkat Holly, and Lillian Hoffman, who were reappointed by the uh, select board on Monday, or at least I, they have not told me they didn't vote on it, but they were supposed to vote on it Monday. So congratulations to you. Glad to have the benefit of your experience back here on the board. Um, the flip side of that is on behalf of the board in the town, I'd like to extend my appreciation to Dan Riccadelli, who is stepping down as of the end of tonight's meeting. Um, we'd like to thank you for all your contributions to the board uh, and your service to the town. It has really been wonderful working with you these last couple of years. Um, and we would wish you well on the opposite bank of the, uh, the Mystic River. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's been my pleasure. It's been really fun to to work with you all and to learn so much about zoning. I'll bring that with me where I go. Fantastic. I'm sure Medford has a zoning board of just itching for, for members. I think, I think I'll take a little sabbatical for, for a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Understandable. Um, and so, uh, we have the, the vacancy on the board uh, in the full position. Um, and at the November 4th meeting of the select board, they will be voting to elevate our own Adam LeBlanc uh, to that very soon to be vacant seat on the board. Um, and uh, I have asked the select board to start advertising for more for new associate members. Um, as, uh, Elaine Hoffman has, has agreed to stay on with us for a short period of time, um, but has also expressed an interest in uh, in stepping down. Um, but will stay with us so that we are we're able to maintain a five member board uh, should someone be absent until such time as we can get new members. So appreciate her doing that. Appreciate uh, Adam stepping up, and uh, we'll be missing missing Dan on his. Uh, but we'll wave across the river as we see you. Right. So, are there any anything further, Mr. Moore? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, I also want to add uh, my uh, thanks to Mr. Licadelli. I've appreciated his viewpoint over these um, many long months, and uh, their their loss, their uh, gain is our loss, unfortunately. But um, he's welcome back anytime, right, Mr. Chair? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Um. I also want to say that just uh, because just because I can't seem to necessarily be timely in terms of my participation in these meetings, you don't have to continue all the cases to a later date. <laughs> it's okay. I mean, I can miss a few, right? Of course. Of course. Okay. But Sounds be the like same it, not here. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like it was an exciting and rather complicated night, as all. <laughs> Thank you. Nice thank you, Mr. Moore. And thank you all for your participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting. I'd especially like to thank Colleen Ralston, Mike Champa, Mike Cunningham, and Jacqueline Munson for their assistance in preparing for and hosting our online meeting. Please note the purpose of the board's recording of the meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of the proceedings. And it's our understanding that the recording made by ACMI will be available on demand at acmi.tv within the coming days. If anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the Zoning Board of Appeals website. And to conclude tonight's meeting, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. A second. Thank you, Mr. Riccardelli. The roll call vote of the board. Mr. Hanlon. Uh, yes. Mr. Holly. Yes. Mr. Riccardelli. Yes. Ms. Hoffman. Yes. Mr. LeBlanc. Yes. And the chair votes yes. We are adjourned. Thank you all very much for your time tonight. ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help.